to Jimmy, who is, I don't even know your title at Coding Safe, actually. Yeah, uh, CTO. CTO of Coding Safe, okay. I just know Jimmy is Jimmy. So, <laughs> um, but you've been doing a lot of stuff. I've, I've been loving seeing like Coding Safe grow as an organization. So that's been really cool. Um, and you can work with a lot of really cool clients too. So, um, seeing that and, uh, and, and, and kind of getting your philosophy today on like running engineer organizations, I think is really interesting. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Tracy. I am so excited to be here, be on this podcast and talking to you. Yeah. I'm also a big fan of what you've built up over at this dot and, you know, your community act work and, uh, activity. Thanks. Yeah. It's definitely a fun place to be. Um, okay. So <sighs> developers and engineering and, uh, developer performance. I think like these are all things that, you know, especially in, you know, this economy, um, there's been a lot of conversations from a leadership perspective on like how to do it right. What are we doing? Okay. You know, what's the spend look like, et cetera. And I know there's a lot of different philosophies and you're always so good. Every time I talk to you, like you have like all these book recommendations and like different things you've studied in the industry. So I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on kind of what's happening right now in this space. Yeah. Thanks. Um, maybe, um, maybe we can start off too with a kind of a hot take on yes. that too, um, <laughs> which is this feels like the possibly worst time to be on the job market as an engineer since mm -hmm. maybe 20, like 2000, into, mm -hmm. like 2000, 2002, like it's, uh, not 2008. Yeah. This was, this feels worse than 2008. Really? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Like, I think if this was 2008, you know, we've been through about a year of layoffs and slowdown. And I think things yeah. were starting to recover by like 2000 you know, early 2010, 2009. Right. Uh, so this, this feels um, significant. So I would say to anybody out there listening um, who is, you know, on the job hunt, um, it's not you, it's them. Mm. Um, you know, this is a, a really interesting time to be on the market. Um, also another hot take too. And I think this kind of ties into the work that we do at, at this dot in coding scape. Um, I'm going to pause here so you can edit it out if you want before we go live. But I think there's a there's a really strong case for demanding to be treated better as a class of workers right now from our employers. Um, I'm not saying unionized, but you know the the way that a lot of people were let go over the last uh, mm. the last year is really reprehensible to me. Like. Being, having your access turned off in the morning before you even wake up and finding out from your you know, your Nest or your Amazon Alexa that you were let go is, um, you know, it, it's not the, the right way to treat workers and help build a, a business. So um, that's my hot take. And it does tie into, I think, what we're going to talk about here, which is how do you measure developer productivity? How do engineering organizations show their value to the rest of the business, especially in a time right now where, you know, the focus is now more on efficiency and staying under budget than it is on growth at all costs. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice, you know, the past few years, just like, well, we're just testing stuff out. Let's just hang out for a little bit and see what happens. Um, but yes, definitely like going back to the basics and figuring out like what actually drives the business is, uh, is, is most of the conversations that are happening. So, um, you were talking about like different frameworks to you from the following. Like, do we want to kind of talk through those things? Cause I think, um, looking at different frameworks and philosophies is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to, uh, my, my background here, uh, as far as recommendations go too, is, um, if you're not subscribed to the pragmatic engineering newsletter, that's a great one to follow. Um, mm -hmm. it has, uh, it, this was a conversation that happened maybe back in, uh, earlier this year in the newsletter um, mm -hmm. between the, the newsletter author and another uh, expert named Laura Taco. And it was, was a, a conversation about a couple of different frameworks. Um, and then uh -huh. last month, McKinsey came out with their own framework and kind of dropped a bomb into the, the whole conversation. 
uh, about yeah. it. So this is a great time to recap on that. This is so funny that you mentioned Laura because her and I are on the same baby schedule. So she's uh... a... <laughs> awesome. And I was All like right. just talking to her, but I didn't even know she was, you know, in this whole uh, in this whole thing. So that's really cool. Yeah, I just I actually just took a, a workshop from her that was oh, really awesome. Oh, uh, that's so much fun. The highlight the highlight of that workshop for me was watching um, like she we we took a a, a metric. Um, and the metric was how do you measure uh, a developer's ability to innovate and to work autonomously? And she helped us actually break that down into things you could measure. Uh, and it was oh. it was incredible, right? Like how do you how do you turn developer uh, autonomy into a measurable metric on your developer engineering dashboard? And uh, it was a good good uh, thing to watch her do as an expert. So yeah, hi, yeah. We could just hang up now and let's go get Laura to talk about this. I know. Well, I just invited her and she's like, oh, you know, we got some baby stuff happening. I was like, oh, me too. But awesome. <laughs> we'll calm down in a bit. Okay. Yes. Let's get back to it. But I love that. I love that you're mentioning Laura and I have to tell her. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, the kind of baseline is uh, mm -hmm. what what is referred to as the Dora metrics uh, and Google, I believe, uh, kind of pioneered these um, and that's featured in the Accelerate book. Uh, okay. And it's measuring, you know, kind of four, four things uh, as far as a deployment and development team goes. And this is not about talking about like story points or, you know, sprint level metrics. This is really about the, the systems that we build as engineers. Uh -huh. um, and so Dora is about the the cycle time, which is you know how long it takes code to go into production after it's finished. Uh -huh. um, the deployment frequency, which is how often you are releasing to production. Uh, and then there's also a mean time to restore uh, service, which you know when something goes wrong, how long does it impact uh, customers? And then the last one is the change failure rate. And from there, we can determine, um, you know, what it, uh, you know, how often we're introducing defects into our deploys. You know, this doesn't have anything to do with QA or, you know, acceptance criteria. This is just purely about deploying. Um, and I do have a graphic I could share on this. Maybe I can just send it to you if you want to put it in yeah, definitely. later. Um, yeah, Because I don't want to mess up like this, the display at the screen share. Um, and then, uh, building on top of that, there's another framework called space, uh, mm -hmm. and space super complicated. So I don't want to get too much into it without like a graphic, but the idea there is combining both like the ability to measure out output and stability like Dora does with, um, what goes into creating code. So measuring this, the S is satisfaction and well being of the team. Um, P is the out is performance outcomes. Um, A is activities. C is communication and collaboration, and E is efficiency and flow. Um, and there's all all kinds of things you can measure with this. In fact, in Laura's workshop a pitch for anybody that wants to learn more to take that for sure. Um, she's got an entire Notion page of different kinds of metrics uh, you can measure based on the business, based on the the product, etc. That you can kind of combine into these things. I love that. That's amazing. This program is presented by This.Labs, the framework agnostic consulting firm helping enterprises realize their technical goals through staff augmentation, consulting, project management, on-demand subject experts, training, and other professional services. Find out more at this.labs.com. Yeah, it's, a, it's interesting because I think like, um, you know, for engineering leadership or management, you know, a lot of people come from engineering backgrounds and then you just kind of like, you know, fall up the ladder, I suppose, into leadership positions. And, you know, a lot of things are just run very intuitively, right? Like we know how to do this, we know how to build, okay, let's build a team this way. Um, but, you know, a lot of these frameworks allow you to kind of like be more tactical or thoughtful on how to, how to run engineering orgs. So they're, they're great ones to kind of reference. Um, what's the third one? So the third one is um, a new one in the last couple of years. And, mm -hmm. and it's important to note that these are not like uh, 
you know, these are based on academic research. So mm -hmm. the, the cycle time between each of these frameworks coming out is, is long and they're backed up by, you know, academic research and peer reviewed articles. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so DX is the last, uh, the one that's, that's newer. Um, and that combines both Dora and space, uh, into uh, into a couple of metrics that can be observed uh, as well, mm -hmm. uh, kind of built on top. And there's also a um, there's a platform called DX as well. So when you Google it, you're going to find that one first. Um, in fact, a lot of you know there's Jellyfish, uh, Code Climate, yes. Yes, um, yes. a couple of other others as well, like the Plural Site product that all. Mm -hmm. try to build in like these these dashboards as well on top mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. although i'm always a fan of uh you know excel and or you know Airtable or something as well for getting a quick dashboard put up um, yeah yeah it. and i've definitely talked to a lot of um teams that have used something like jellyfish before and um are you into it what do you uh, want for yeah i think um Jellyfish is a really good one, as is Code Climate. Um, mm -hmm. I think it really depends on the the yeah. This is a really interesting question. Actually, am I into it? Um, I think if you ask somebody at, at any of those companies who are the main users of their products, uh, mm -hmm. it's often and it's often like a VP or C level person who is needs to look at a dashboard quarterly or monthly to just mm -hmm. check to see like how, you know, they might have concerns or other questions and they're using these dashboards to, uh, to look at them. But I don't think developers generally look at like the, these dashboards daily. It's more of an engineering manager right. job to keep them updated. And then a, you know, director or C levels, director VP C levels, is the are the ones that are actually looking at the dashboards and the, the deltas over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, McKinsey's. Yeah, McKinsey's. McKinsey, uh, wow, this is so, so interesting what they kind of came out with um, and so kind of cringe uh, at the surface. And then I think as you dig <laughs> is that into the it. That's a name, cringe. Cringe. McKinsey's engineering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, McCringy's. Uh, <laughs> framework uh is uh, at the surface level it feels a little icky and then when you get into it it feels really icky oh. um but you know they they advocate using um some of the metrics from space and dora and also adding on this concept of uh, inner and outer loop um of activities so an inner loop for a developer is writing code testing code uh, committing code, mm -hmm. an outer loop for a developer would be meetings, um, meetings, uh, design sessions, architecture, things like that. All meetings. And <laughs> all meetings. Yeah. And, uh, so what McKinsey is advocating is measuring the ratio of time spent in the inner loop to outer loop for, in, for developers and mm. saying that, the the inner loop is a more valuable place for engineers software engineers to spend time than the yeah. outer loop and that there should be some measurable thing there yeah uh, i mean on the surface is, is it, yeah on the, it doesn't sound that icky that doesn't sound terrible right it, less median sounds really nice but then when you get into like what those activities are on the inner loop you know and i think we all kind of do function like that as individual engineers but when you look at like what the inner loop consists of there's no there's no collaboration happening mm -hmm. in there there's no design time included oh, there oh yeah right it's uh it's very much a code monkey inner loop um mm -hmm. and don't get involved in the you know the business don't think outside of your current task type oh. of thing uh, on the inner loop which is where it gets a little icky yeah. also it does feel like to me that mckinsey is maybe trying to by using the inner and outer loop terminology i think they may be trying to create some sort of big O notation for developer productivity so they can, you know, effectively sell that to one of their clients to say, you know, like, 
You've got. You, should, uh, you shouldn't talk to the developers. You have these outer loop people. Right. You need more layers. Yeah. Uh, and don't worry about these developers kind of deal. Mm -hmm. So like yep. extracting away um, more involvement. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's out. I mean, less meetings. I mean, who the developers dream, right? But then you're totally right. Like, what about collaboration? What about getting involved? What about like understanding what truly what the business wants and who should be doing that? Yeah, nailed it. Such a hard balance. Um, so, like, why do you feel like there's so much stuff happening right now, generally, when it comes to developer performance and trying to, like, put metrics on it and, like, just all these conversations happening? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think we're in an interesting time in the economy as we kind of opened up talking about. Um, and there is a lot of demand on business models to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. And so that's really flowing down to all the other areas and aspects of organizations as well. Yeah. But do you feel like, I mean, you know, um, you know, do you feel like engineering teams are like not accountable for their work, like deliverables and things like that? Or what's the. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I've been on a lot of different engineering teams. So that's, uh, you know, uh, and, and I'd say, I think what I, how I'd answer that is to say that, um, in, especially for like the past, like five or six years, uh, you know, outside of working on a startup. And I don't think if you're on a startup, you shouldn't be implementing these dashboards because your job is to build a product first. Uh, mm -hmm. But on larger engineering teams over the last, you know, half decade, uh, it's been very good times and, um, you know, increasing efficiency of a process, like a checkout process mm -hmm. or, a conversion of a you know between one step of a funnel and another by even less than a percent could result in millions tens of millions of more dollars in revenue for the business itself and so yeah. um the accountability has been on or the, the the accountability or the metrics everybody's been looking at are like the end result the trailing indicator as far mm -hmm. as um you know did we drive more revenue yes then what we did must have worked um, which is not always a true statement. Mm -hmm. uh, now, without the ability to use like the trailing indicators of revenue, customer acquisition, et cetera, uh, engineering organizations are flailing a bit, trying to figure out how to measure success and also how to measure impact of changes made in the engineering organizations. Mm. Because like, you know, I guess I, I, you know, if you take that checkout flow, for example, right, it's like, oh, well, we improved conversions by X. And are you saying that, like, maybe some of those improvements were just based on, like, the economy doing better, the economy booming generally? And, like, now that everything is down, the, the hey, we improved conversion rate by X might be a little bit off because now we're kind of like in a down economy so there's less whatever and then it's like well what, what value is this yeah, yeah yeah exactly from a business sense maybe things are being discounted or conversion rate is increasing but the total number of customers acquired through marketing is down yeah uh, the average sale value could be lower like you know all kinds of things mean that it doesn't you know that improving the, the funnel conversion rate, it doesn't move the needle as much as it did before. Yeah. 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 Hmm. That's an interesting one to ponder on. Does performance actually affect revenue? We thought it has for five or six years, but maybe we're wrong. <laughs> Another hot take. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, that's kind of where if we were maybe at a bar, uh, we get into this next topic, which is like, does it make sense to have, you know, 100 engineers working on increasing conversion rate of like the final step in a checkout flow, or should they be launching rockets into space or, you know, basically building large language models or, or something, right? Like it's, yeah. I think the, the period we're moving into is going to be one where 
new bets are rewarded more than improving efficiency hmm. in existing existing processes. That's kind of interesting too, because I feel like almost in this economy, you look at things, or I mean, not even just in this economy, right? But like, generally speaking, if you double down on what's working and improve, you know, the thing by the 1%, the 2%, the whatever, you would think that that's more productive than making big bets, you know, like, oh, spending, you know, whatever. I mean, we're going to spend like 80% of our, you know, R&D budget on something that might not even impact us from a revenue perspective. We have no idea. And versus like spending 80% of that engineering, you know, the R and D budget on improving the product. So you think we're moving more towards the 80% spending spent on R and D because I feel like that's what we've been doing for the past two years. Mm -hmm. Like, no, I think, I think we're going to see even more of that here. Like uh, more R and D more R and D. Yeah. Really? Hmm. Because what in, isn't that like so counterintuitive though? Like that feels very counterintuitive to me. Yeah, and it's I'm happy to have to be proven wrong on this too. Um, yeah. But it, it feels like the, um, especially with the the efficiency tool gains coming out of like a uh, you know LLM, yeah, that stuff uh, as well as stuff we haven't really even tapped into yet, which is starting to run large language models and other neural nets on like smaller and smaller devices that mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be hitting like an inflection point where there's a lot of new technology to implement as opposed oh. to just, you know, I, I keep using the shopping cart example just because Shopify is such a, a huge thing right now, but right. instead of continuing to kind of squeeze less and less juice out of existing platforms. Mm. Yes, this is definitely an opposing opinion of what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Space, spaces I'm, I'm really interested in for developers and, you know, that we were just yeah. talking about, it is a hard time for developers to yeah. get hired at some of these companies. But I think there's a tremendous opportunity in uh, space. Yeah. Uh, in VR, AR stuff, mm -hmm. you know, we know there are new hardware platforms coming out for those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think data science and machine learning is just getting started. Yeah. Uh, new forms of interfaces beyond like cell phones and, uh, you know, computers, you know, voice yeah. type stuff. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of work to do out there. Um, yeah. And it's not iterating. It's, it's ground up work. It's not iterating on work that, you know, has been done for the last yeah. 20 years. I mean, well, that's fun. I mean, that means, you know, that means there's a lot of jobs that are about to come. So in new spaces. Um, so like, okay, suggestions, best practices for how engineering teams can kind of overcome the challenges or questions when it comes to developer performance. Yeah, I think the, the biggest one I've seen, um, you know, coding escape and this daughter both consulting uh, groups. Uh, and so I'm sure you've probably seen this too, which is where, you know, at some point, uh, some VP or C-level person who's tangential to the development team is wondering why things take so long. And so they Google how to pull stats out of GitHub or something. And then they go to the VP of engineering or engineering manager with like a list of like, you know, some report they pull out of GitHub that's not really actionable and say, we need, you know, why, this is why things are taking so long type of thing, right? Like nobody's coding or there's not enough pull requests because I read online that there should be more pull requests. Uh, and, and so when things get to that point, uh, it, it's already kind of gone bad. So the like engineering managers and directors need to be ahead of that conversation and the, these dashboards help, but good communication helps even better. I think mm. it's like the best practice is just being clear. Uh, engineers, I think we all have the mentality that as deadlines get closer, we start to work harder um, and then we can solve all problems by crunch time. Uh, in fact, uh, one of my favorite books that we talked about earlier, The Soul of a New Machine is about like some epic crunch time uh, that created like one of the first mini computers. Uh, and that, that ethos exists still in software, but 
when you're dealing with a large organization that has marketing and it has sales and people need to be able to like schedule their campaigns and, you know, wrap up sales teams for a new launch that you, you have to give them plenty of heads up when things are behind schedule um, or if a project is at risk, not just assure them that we're going to work as hard as we can to finish the finish on the day. Yes. Unhealthy as well. Amen. In that life. <laughs> um, okay, but before we go on, I forgot to say thank you to our sponsors. This dot, thank you, this dot, thank you, my team for letting me like hang out with people like Jimmy, chat about this stuff, and really share more about engineering and leadership. Um, this dot, we're a dev consultancy, so uh, we get to work with fun companies like PlayStation, Capital One, Herman Miller, T Mobile, and if you are facing challenges like you need to upgrade your legacy systems, um, let us know. <laughs> you can visit us at this.co. That's T H I S D O T dot C-O. Um, Jimmy, before this conversation, we talked and you gave me the most funnest, best hot take I've ever heard in my life. Oh, there were some good hot takes at the beginning of this conversation <laughs> as well. But, um, you know, waterfall versus agile. You were saying waterfall is the way. <laughs> oh, boy, I just got canceled. I'm actually looking at all my tweets getting ratioed right now. Um, I think, uh, you know, we were just talking about how important it is to flag when, you know, a project is either running behind or at risk for some reason. And this is I think, still the same, like the best practices thing, like how do you, yeah. how do you counter this? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think your, what you, the hot take we just talked about, which is, uh, waterfall is not dead. It yeah. means we should acknowledge that some projects are effectively waterfall in that the requirements are defined up front. The scope is, is well understood. And the job is to burn down that list of requirements and tasks. The job yeah. is not to iterate every two weeks and learn and add new requirements to the burn down. Yeah. 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 I mean, that makes sense. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, I feel like every agile organization is like agile ish anyways, mm -hmm. like what truly is agile. Yeah. It's, you know, if we can rec I think we recognize as practitioners that continuous integration and continuous deployment lead to higher quality software. Um, yeah. And that, the agile methodology of, uh, especially when you add product managers into that agile methodology results in uh, software that better meets the requirements. Uh, but also there are projects that are well scoped, like we just said. And if we try to take an agile methodology approach to that, we can end up increasing the scope of the project beyond what was initially uh, actually needed. Um, yeah. And we can in introduce bloat in the form of meetings. Yeah. Um, you know, if there's if the backlog is set from the beginning of the project, uh, then and we're still doing backlog grooming, then we're kind of wasting a couple of hours a week. Uh, yeah. Mm. Who's introducing that? Are the engineers or the agile coaches? I think it's hot just take. our all of us as our, our hot take is we've been trained to hate the word waterfall, um, mm. and so. You know, we view we as like a, as practitioners, I think, as technologists, think that agile is the way. Um, you know, cue baby Yoda, uh, and instead, uh, you know, we're falling for the the same problem of taking a a model and applying it to a process that doesn't actually fit the model. So we can take parts of agile and and apply it to projects, but we should always be aware of you know, how our methodology matches the scope and requirements of a project. Mm. That makes sense. Um, and it's funny because like everything you say, right, is like, it's so, it's so, it's so counterintuitive. Cause like you say, like less agile means less meetings. Uh, yes. You know, but then, you know, less meetings equals less collaboration. And then again, we're trained to hate this word waterfall. So when you say 
that and you say more waterfall than everybody cringes and you know what is that it's just you know it's it's because you know that's how, how mm. so is it really that bad <laughs> uh, here's, here's a great hot take then for you um something like a best practice we have at, at codingscape is we find that a google doc is the best place for stand-up updates okay um and that is because uh, it provides a history of the standups and oh. it's a, a, like a long running project is going to have a, you know, a, a templated response for each of those. And really the most important thing I, I feel for standups in our current iteration is one, it shouldn't take an hour, right? Yeah. Like it shouldn't be a huge time waste and two, it should surface, uh, blockers. Yeah. And if it's surfacing a blocker, that means you got to follow up on it and somebody else needs to know about it beyond just the stand up. And so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we use, uh, we use a Google doc, uh, and you know, we'll paste that into a Slack channel or wherever like a, a async standup needs to happen. Or if it's in-person standup, we'll read off of it. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that's my hot take is a Google oh. docs are a great form, uh, format for standup updates and saves you a meeting. It's funny because like uh, I work across, you know, d like engineering and marketing and in marketing or, you know, when we do things like developer relations consulting and things like that, right? We use the Google Doc and do the same thing. We have weekly updates. So it's like, it doesn't even sound terrible to me, you know, it sounds mm -hmm. like it makes sense. But yeah, that idea of history and like helping understand and you could probably put one of these, you know, the, do no. one of these tools like take like jellyfish <laughs> take all your stand-ups and like mm -hmm. stick it all into like some sort of you know gpt for engineering or something and it'll like calculate oh, yeah. out all the issues that, that sounds amazing also emojis in yeah. google docs you can easily add like a, a red stop sign emoji is the best emoji to put in there because people look at it and they want to read that more yeah instead, instead of slack or some ac you know teams you know, if you have used Teams, I'm sorry, but uh, if you're using Teams, you know, or Slack, like, there's a lot of competition for your attention in there. But yeah. a, a big red flag or stop sign emoji in a Google Doc usually gets people to pay attention. I love that. Oh, awesome. Okay, we are running out of time. So, Jimmy, where mm -hmm. do we find you? Like, how do we find out more about? Um, yeah, I mean, are you talking about this stuff anywhere? <laughs> yeah, uh, I used to be the number one Jimmy Jacobson on the internet. I don't know if that's still true, um, but I'm on Twitter at Jimmy Jacobson and mm -hmm. uh, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. um, or you can drop me an email at jimmy at codingscape.com. Nice, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Tracy. Appreciate you.